It's the offseason, which means it's time for free agency. Undoubtedly, a number of players this year are going to pull in some massive contracts, like Aaron Judge, Trey Turner, Carlos Correa, Jacob deGrom, and Xander Bogarts. But history has shown that these massive deals don't always work. Sometimes they turn into a financial sinkhole for the team where the ownership and the fans are just counting down the days until they no longer have that player on the books. According to my research, there's been 72 Major League Baseball contracts, when adjusted for inflation, come to more than $100 million. Today we're going to look at the 11 absolute worst of those 72 contracts after the intro. If you're familiar with my other videos, with any kind of player ranking, I try to find an analytical way to put the list together that tries to create as objective as a methodology as possible. This list is going to be no different. The metric we're going to use is dollar per win above replacement. But before we go into that, a couple of notes. I'm only including contracts that are complete. While players like Steven Strasburg and Patrick Corbin are currently looking to make a list like this, they both still have multiple years left on their contracts, so there's still a chance they could turn it around. I'm including all free agent contracts and extensions as long as the extensions don't include arbitration years. Buying out arbitration years to get a few free agent years, a really common thing with extensions, throws a whole wrench into this analysis because arbitration years are a massive discount compared to buying a player's free agent years. Also, in the calculations, I'm not using regular monetary inflation, but what I'm calling baseball inflation. What I mean by that is baseball salaries have gone up way more than regular inflation in the last 50 years. What I did was base everything off of the league average salary at the time versus today. Without further ado, the 11 worst free agent contracts or extensions in baseball history. Number 11, Mike Hampton, 2001 Rockies. The Colorado Rockies have always been a team with a pitching problem. Playing in the highest elevation stadium in baseball, by a long margin, the lowered air resistance means pitchers' pitches don't have near as much movement, are more hittable, and fly further when the batter does make contact. For that reason, free agent pitchers have always been hesitant to sign with the Rockies, as it's been known to be a place where pitchers' careers go to die, meaning the Rockies have to shell out a bit more than any other team to land top pitching. That was the case with Mike Hampton. Signed in December of 2000, Mike Hampton was offered the largest contract in baseball history up to that point. Now, I don't want to sound like I'm being overly negative on Mike here, and he was a good pitcher leading up to that contract, but when you think of the pitchers in the league at that time, Pedro Martinez, Greg Maddox, Roger Clemens, Randy Johnson, Mike Hampton isn't near that level. You knew, even at the time, that him getting the largest contract in baseball history was a hell of an overpay. But the Rockies had a glaring need at starting pitching. Since their inception, the Rockies had the worst starting pitching ERA in the league and the third worst starting pitching wins above replacement. It makes some sense for them to splurge on starting pitching. But compared to another pitcher, Mike Mussina, who signed a six-year, $88.5 million deal with the Yankees just nine days before Hampton, Hampton's eight-year, $121 million contract is almost criminal. But that's talking about the signing. How did he perform during the contract? Well, not well. During his first two years, he started 62 games and had a 5.75 ERA. His strikeouts per nine innings was a laughably low 4.6. On the bright side, he was by far the best hitting pitcher in the league during those two years, hitting 315 with 10 home runs. An absolutely crazy stat is with Colorado, he accumulated 0.3 war, minus 1.6 on the pitching side and plus 1.9 on the hitting side. His entire positive output was with the bat. After those two years, the Rockies had seen enough. They packaged Hampton with Juan Pierre in a trade with the Marlins. The Marlins were apparently only interested in Pierre because just two days later, they traded Hampton to the Braves for a relief pitcher and a minor leaguer. To Hampton's credit, he did bounce back a little. While nowhere near his pre-Rockies days, from 2003 to 2005 on the Braves, he was a slightly below league average starting pitcher before requiring Tommy John surgery near the end of 2005. He missed all of 2006 and 2007 before returning in 2008 for the last year of his contract. He played pretty mediocre across 13 starts that year and secured a much smaller one-year $2 million contract in 2009 with the Astros. He only pitched 4.1 innings in 2010 with the Diamondbacks before retiring. All said, baseball inflation adjusted, Mike Hampton signed an eight-year $190 million contract, earned 6.2 wins above replacement, coming to $30.65 million per war. Number 10, Albert Bell, 1999 Orioles. 
Unlike Mike Hampton, Albert Bell had a track record going into free agency that demanded a massive deal. Finishing top 10 in MVP voting in five of six seasons from 1993 to 1998, he was one of the best left fielders in baseball in the mid-90s, and his first free agent contract with the White Sox showed that. After signing with the White Sox, he became the highest paid player in baseball for the 1997 season and the first player in baseball history to make over $10 million in a season. In that contract, he lived up to, hitting 79 home runs and accumulating 8.6 war in two seasons. After the 1998 season, he had a unique clause in his contract that stipulated he would remain one of the three highest paid players in baseball throughout his contract. The White Sox didn't agree he was worth that much, opting out and making him a free agent going into 1999. The Orioles, on the other hand, saw it differently. They then signed him to a five-year, $65 million contract, which again made him the highest paid player in baseball. In the end, the White Sox looked very smart passing up on Bell's pay raise. While he had a good 1999 with the Orioles, hitting 37 home runs with a 941 OPS, his 2000 season was a step back offensively. It's also important to note that he was one of the worst defensive left fielders in the league during this time, accumulating negative 3.3 D war. But things went from bad to worse during 2001. During spring training, he was diagnosed with degenerative hip osteoarthritis. The Orioles said that he was totally disabled and unable to perform as a Major League Baseball player. He was forced into retirement and never played baseball again. Fortunately for the Orioles, about 70% of his remaining contract was covered by insurance. Still, his inflation-adjusted contract was a total of five years, $135.1 million, and he accumulated four wins above replacement, coming to $33.78 million per win. Number 9. Prince Fielder, 2012, Tigers. Coming off his last year with the Brewers in 2011, Prince Fielder was an icon of the game. The home run derby champ and three-time All-Star was set to make a massive amount of money in free agency. The Brewers made an offer of five years, $100 million, but that was never a serious offer that anyone thought Fielder would sign. Instead, Fielder signed a massive nine-year deal worth $214 million with the Detroit Tigers. Along with Miguel Cabrera, the Tigers were looking to have one of the best one-two punches in the league. And off the bat, that looked to be the case. By the 2012 All-Star break, Fielder and Cabrera combined for a league-leading 134 RBIs. After 2012, the contract was looking like a massive success. Fielder accumulated 4.7 war, the second highest total in his career, and received MVP votes. However, 2013 saw a bit of a dip. He was worse in nearly every single offensive stat, along with some of the worst first base defense in the league. With seven years still on the contract, the Tigers were suffering from a bit of buyer's remorse. They traded Fielder to the Rangers for Ian Kinsler. Much like the White Sox opting out on Albert Bell's contract, this turned out to be a great move for the Tigers. Fielder's decline was real. He had an injury riddled 2014 and 2016, with 2015 being the only semi-productive season with the Rangers. Again, very similar to Albert Bell, Fielder was forced into medical retirement during the 2015 season due to C4, C5 herniations in his neck. Also similar to Bell, insurance picked up some of the remaining money on his contract. Of the $96 million of payments still due to Fielder, the Tigers would pay $24 million, the Rangers would pay $36 million, and insurance would pay $36 million. Interesting fact about this contract, because all that money is guaranteed and paid in full regardless if Fielder plays. In 2020, when all active players had their contracts prorated due to the COVID shortened season, Prince Fielder was the highest paid player in the league despite retiring four years earlier. With an inflation-adjusted contract of nine years, $237 million, and a production of seven war, in the end, Fielder's massive deal came to $33.9 million per win. Number eight, Josh Hamilton, 2013, Angels. Hamilton's story is a weird one. Drafted first overall by the Devil Rays in the 1999 draft, in 2001 he began excessive drug and alcohol use and was sent to the Betty Ford Center for Drug Rehabilitation. He ended up failing a drug test during spring training of 2003 and took a year off for personal reasons. He then failed three drug tests in 2004, earning a suspension for the entire season. He was arrested in 2005 for smashing the windshield of a friend's truck and was suspended again for the entire season following another relapse. At this point, he was looking like a massive bust for the Rays. They left him unprotected in the 2006 Rule 5 draft, where he was taken by the Chicago Cubs and then immediately traded for the Reds for cash. But this is where the story turns around. In 2007, he was apparently clean for the first time in years and broke out with the Reds. Prior to 2008, he was traded to the Rangers and continued his prolific hitting, earning his first All-Star appearance and garnering MVP votes. 
At this point in his career, Hamilton was the poster boy for overcoming addiction and turning one's life around, and his remaining team control years with the Rangers were wildly productive, peaking with him winning league MVP in 2010. But not all was right. While he was putting out a born-again image, there were still relapses. In 2009, photos of him shirtless in a bar with reports of him looking for cocaine emerged. Prior to the 2012 season, his last team control year, it was reported that he had another relapse with alcohol. But every time these reports surfaced, he would apologize. The team would report how they have him on a program with a mentor, and his on-field availability and production remain strong. So the warning signs were there for an implosion, but like in many sports, production reigns king and the Angels ignored all the warning signs, giving Hamilton a five-year, $125 million contract. On the Angels, Hamilton never came close to his level of play with the Rangers. After two pretty subpar seasons with the Angels and a shoulder surgery prior to the 2015 season, Hamilton relapsed again and voluntarily reported to Major League Baseball. While the Angels laid out a rehab plan for him, Angels owner Arte Moreno hinted to the press that they were looking to cut ties with Hamilton. They traded him back to the Rangers for cash and a player to be named later in April of 2015, with three years still left on the contract. He played a total of 50 games with the Rangers in 2015 before knee injuries kept him off the field for the rest of his career. Pretty disastrous signing for the Angels, but this is not the end of Hamilton's heartwarming story. He was arrested in 2019 and charged with injury to a child after being accused of physically assaulting his daughter. He was indicted on a felony charge in 2020 for again beating his daughter. That boarding in story that made all the headlines during his successful years with the Rangers is now long in the past. And from a contract standpoint, he damn well earned his spot on this list. Inflation adjusted, his contract was five years, 125 million, and he earned a total of 3.2 wins above replacement, coming to $39 million per win above replacement and memories that Angels fans wish they could erase. Number seven, Carl Crawford, 2011 Red Sox. All of the contracts previously mentioned you could argue were overpays even at the time of the signing. Sure, the players were good, but relative to other free agent deals at the time, along with the risks those players carried, all of them were at least on the higher end of what you'd expect. Carl Crawford doesn't fall into that category. He was a bona fide star with his time with Tampa Bay and an exciting player to watch. Always near the league league in stolen bases and triples, along with a healthy batting average and on-base percentage, he was your prototypical leadoff hitter and had his best season right before hitting free agency. In his last year with Tampa, he stole 47 bases, hit 307, knocked a career-high 19 home runs, and scored 110 runs, accumulating a great seven-war season, and finished seventh in the MVP voting. It was the best case scenario for him to lock up a lucrative deal. And he did just that, signing a seven-year, $142 million contract with the Red Sox. His first season with the team was headline-inducing, and not for the right reasons. This was one of the most infamous stories of clubhouse dysfunction that I can remember. Articles came out about how the pitching rotation settled into a routine of swilling brew, eating fast food chicken, and playing video games in the clubhouse rather than support their struggling teammates in the dugout. Manager Terry Francona completely lost his ability to motivate the team and was distracted by his own marital problems. He apparently lived in a hotel during the season. Leadership was constantly in question and multiple reports linked players to being detached and uninspired. At the center of this, and possibly the scapegoat of the team, was Crawford. He developed a chronic wrist condition and a strained ligament in his elbow that eventually resulted in wrist and Tommy John surgery. He had a number of complaints about the medical staff during this time and later described his two years with Boston as the toughest time in my life and compared it to a scar that I think will never go away. He also said, it was just everything. Me not playing well, me being in an unfamiliar area and environment that was toxic, just all those things combined. You start to say, is it ever gonna end? Asked if he regretted signing with the Red Sox, Crawford replied, a lot of times I did. You hear a lot of talk about how I just wanted money. At some point you wondered if you made the right decision. The fans had no love for Crawford either. He was viewed as an overpaid diva that was really a summation of the problems the Red Sox had that season. Needless to say, he had to get out of Boston. After two injury-riddled seasons where he performed nowhere close to the level he did in Tampa, the Red Sox traded him to the Dodgers in a massive salary dump for the team. While Crawford played a little bit better with the Dodgers, he was still nowhere close to his Tampa Bay production. He had nagging injuries throughout his tenure, and with almost two years left on his contract, the Dodgers released him, and he went into retirement. Inflation adjusted, Crawford signed a seven-year, $159.7 million contract and accrued 3.6 war, good enough for $44.4 million per win. Number six, Jordan Zimmerman, 2016, Tigers. When the Expos moved to Washington and became the Nationals, the Nationals embarked on a half-decade rebuild that was highlighted by a number of great draft picks. Ryan Zimmerman, 
Bryce Harper, Anthony Rendon, Steven Strasburg, all highly touted, memorable players. But somewhat forgotten in that time was 2007 second round pick Jordan Zimmerman. He threw the Nationals first no-hitter, finished top 10 in the Cy Young voting twice, was a two-time All-Star, and was a staple in the Nationals rotation for five years. Why is he forgotten? Probably due to the free agent deal he signed with the Tigers going into 2016. While he had five seasons in a row with an ERA under four prior to the deal, and one season under three, after signing with the Tigers, he never saw below four and a half. While he made 32 or more starts in the four seasons leading up to free agency, he never crossed 30 again as injuries took their toll. While he put up 20.3 war in seven years with the Nationals, he put up a total of 1.8 over the course of his five-year deal. Funny thing is, the deal was off to a great start. His first month with the Tigers in 2015, he was the American League Pitcher of the Month with a 5-0 record and only giving up two earned runs in 33 innings pitched. After that month, he missed action due to a variety of injuries, including a neck strain, right shoulder strain, UCL strain, and right forearm strain, and when he was able to pitch, the results were not very good. All in all, Zimmerman's inflation-adjusted contract was five years, $109.7 million, accruing just 1.8 war for a total of $61 million per war. Number five, Mo Vaughn, 1999, Angels. Mo Vaughn was a stud first baseman for the Red Sox. Winning MVP in 1995 and putting up an OPS plus of over 144 in the five seasons leading up to free agency. Based off that, the Angels decided to give him a five-year, $80 million contract. Now, if you were to just look at his raw offensive numbers with the Angels, it doesn't look too bad. In the first two years of the contract, he had over 30 home runs, over 100 RBIs, and pretty solid looking stats. But when you adjust for this being in the midst of the steroid era, those two seasons take a huge hit compared to the rest of the league. OPS plus under 120, war under two for each season, but still not terrible though, and after those two years, you wouldn't think this contract would be fifth worst of all time. But things took a turn for the worst as he missed the entire 2001 season due to injury, was traded to the Mets for Kevin Apier prior to 2002, and the last three years of his contract with the Mets were pretty lackluster, with him missing almost two whole seasons, and when he was able to play, he racked up a total of negative 1.2 war. But the thing that's really noteworthy is what came out in a few interviews after he was traded. Angels relief pitcher Troy Percival said, We may miss Moe's bat, but we won't miss his leadership. Darren Erstad is our leader. Moe absolutely lost it after he heard this. His full reaction, with me changing a couple choice words so I don't get demonetized. Let me say this, who the fudge is Troy Percival? Has he led his team to a pennant? Has he ever freaking pitched in a big game that meant something? This guy talks so much crap, and he hasn't even done crap. He has the right to evaluate and analyze people, but what the hell has he done to deserve that right? He hasn't done stuff to lead them anywhere. I got hardware, I got playoff appearances, I got an MVP, I've been to the playoffs twice. What the hell has he done? Who the hell is he? I tried to be cool here. I tried to be nice of this whole situation concerning the Angels all the way around. Ain't none of them done a damn thing in this damn game, bottom line. They ain't got no flags hanging at freaking Edison Field, so the hell with them. I went out there and played when I didn't have to play. That organization freaking destroyed my arm. They did a lot of stuff that I never even spoke about, and all I kept hearing from these people is this and that. I kept playing. They had surgery on the arm and infected it again. I had to rehab my whole situation by myself. So the Angels, they better leave me alone. Freaking Troy Percival, he ain't done stuff to be talking about anybody, and he's a freaking pitcher too. You don't even freaking play every freaking day, and you're sitting there talking about position players who play every day? I'm sure the Angels regret giving him that contract. Inflation adjusted, Vaughn's contract was a six-year, $160 million deal where he put up a total of 2.4 war for an end result of $66.8 million per war. Number four, Justin Upton, 2018 Angels. This marks the third Angels contract to make this list. Add in that Albert Pujols was just outside this list at number 18, and Anthony Rendon is well on track to go down as a bad contract, the Angels could soon be owners of a whopping five free agent contracts in the top 20 worst contracts of all time. They basically have a terrible contract dynasty. As we saw in 2022, it shows on the field. Despite having two of the best players in baseball in Mike Trout and Shohei Otani, they have no depth whatsoever and nearly every draft pick, trade, or signing has done nothing to fix that. In 2022, Otani and Trout combined for 15.9 B-War. The rest of the Angels roster combined for 15. That means without Trout or Otani, the Angels on paper are around a 100 lost team. 
Most 100 loss teams are usually rebuilding or expected to be that bad going into the season. The fact that the Angels are not rebuilding, in fact, they're actively trying to build a team to make the postseason and spending like sailors to do so, is downright impressive at the level of front office incompetence. But back to Upton. Upton had a very impressive career, at least up until signing that extension with the Angels. At the age of 29, he was finishing up a two-year contract with the Tigers and having one of his better career seasons and was traded to the Angels near the 2017 trade deadline. He continued to impress with a short stint with the Angels to close out the year, which was good enough for the Angels to extend him right after the season ended. In total, a five-year, $106 million deal. His first year of that contract was very good. 30 home runs, 121 OPS plus. Looked like maybe the Angels were going to buck the trend of their terrible free agent signings. But in 2019, the wheels fell off. Injuries took their toll as he never crossed 90 games in a season from 2019 to 2022. And when he was healthy, he looked like a shell of his former self. While he accumulated 3.7 war in 2018, the last four years of the contract he managed a pitiful negative 2.4 war, as his offense was well below average and defensively he lost a step and was one of the worst left fielders in the league. In total, Upton was given an inflation adjusted contract of 5 years, 107 million, accumulated 1.4 war for a total of 76.5 million dollars per war. Number 3, Barry Zito, 2007 Giants. I can already see Giants fans rushing to the comment section to let me know that this contract was well worth it due to his 2012 playoff performance. Zito started a must-win Game 5 in the NLCS against the Cardinals, with the Cardinals up three games to one. Giants fans were not optimistic at the time as his performance up to that point with the Giants wasn't very good. Surprisingly, Zito pitched seven and two-thirds innings of shutout baseball to give the Giants a 5 to nothing victory over the Cardinals. They went on to win the last two games of the series to go up against the Tigers in the World Series. Zito started Game 1 and threw five and two-thirds innings, giving up only one run. He exited with the game well in hand with the Giants leading 6-1 and en route to an 8-3 Game 1 win. They went on to sweep the Tigers in four games. Zito proved to be a catalyst of six straight wins in the playoffs and the Giants' second ring in three years. So if Zito was so instrumental to this run, why is he number three on this list? Well, because this list is unthinking and uncaring and only based on regular season results. And Zito's regular season results of minus 0.4 war over the course of a seven year, $126 million contract goes down as pretty terrible. Before that 2012 playoff run, Giants fans were ready to run him out of town, and his 2013 is up there with one of the worst starting pitching seasons in the last decade, with an impressive 5.74 ERA and a negative 2.5 war. So I tip my hat to his postseason performance, but over the course of his inflation-adjusted contract of seven years, $170 million, Zito's minus 0.4 war gave him a formula-breaking negative $425 million per war. Note that since I'm strictly dividing contract amount by war, and the last three on this list all have negative war, the smaller negative value is actually worse, as we'll see with the last two on this list. Number two, Chris Davis, 2016 Orioles. This dumpster fire of a contract has been covered ad nauseum over the past four years or so. Chris Davis, the once MVP candidate who was the heart of the Orioles' offense during one of the best five-year stretches in recent Orioles history, was given a seven-year, $161 million contract for his age 30 through 36 seasons. Now, giving a contract that big to someone over 30 has turned out bad in the past, but what happened to Davis was beyond just bad. After two so-so seasons where Davis was slightly below league average, he seemingly forgot how to play baseball in 2018. He put up one of the worst seasons by a full-time starter in baseball history, hitting just 168 and striking out over 35% of the time. He ended with minus 2.6 war. Not only that, he ended the season on a 21 at-bat hitless streak. That streak continued into 2019 where he set a major league record with 49 straight hitless at-bats by a position player. For an in-depth look at that streak, check out Foolish Baseball's video called Chris Davis's streak was a one in a million life lesson. 2019 and 2020 were much of the same where Davis put up a batting average well south of the Mendoza line and racked up strikeouts at an unprecedented rate. The Orioles kept sending Davis out to the batter's box to take at bats because they were in full tank mode at the time and were crossing their fingers that maybe he could turn it around. A knee injury ended his 2020 season early and also kept him out all of 2021. At that point, the Orioles had seen enough. They worked out a deal with Davis where he could retire but still get the remaining payments on his contract. 
Inflation-adjusted, Chris Davis signed a seven-year, $162 million contract, accumulated minus 2.8 war, a total of negative 57.9 million per war. Number one, Ryan Howard, 2012 Phillies. It's often overlooked how great Ryan Howard was in his first full seven seasons with the Phillies. In those seven years, he averaged over 40 home runs and 122 RBIs. He was the heart and soul of the offense for a Phillies team that had five straight playoff appearances and one World Series ring. Going into the 2010 season, the Phillies gave Howard a five-year, $125 million extension with an option for a sixth year. However, they already had Howard signed for two more seasons through age 31, and this may be a lot of hindsight talking, but preemptively signing a guy for a premium for his age 32 to 37 seasons seemed like a lot of jumping the gun and setting yourself up for a problem contract. But it was almost poetic, in a bad way, how this contract started out. On the very last at-bat of the last game of the Phillies' 2011 playoff run, which was Howard's last game under his original contract, Howard came to the plate representing the tying run in the fifth game of a best-of-five series against the Cardinals. A win would have clinched the series for the Phillies and sent them to the NLCS. Instead, Howard grounded out to second, ending their season. But one of the biggest cases of adding injury to insult, Howard tore his Achilles while running to first. I was watching this game with a bunch of Phillies fans when it happened, and this play may go down as one of the most devastating plays for the franchise. Not only did it end their postseason run in 2011, but Howard was never the same after that. A guy that averaged over 40 home runs the previous seven seasons never hit over 25 again. Someone with over 120 RBIs in a season never cracked 100 again. Not only that, but it served as a major turning point for the Phillies franchise itself. After five straight playoff runs, the Phillies didn't have a single winning season for the next nine years and finishing in the cellar in the NL East for three of those years. Once Howard's contract was up in 2016 at the age of 36, the Phillies declined their team option for 2017. Howard tried to catch on with the Braves, signing a minor league contract, but never saw the majors again. He officially retired in 2018. All in all, Howard signed an inflation-adjusted contract of five years, 147 million, and managed a staggering negative 4.8 war for a total of negative 30.6 million per war. Shortly in the future, I'm gonna release a companion video to this one detailing the best 1100 plus million dollar contracts. So if this list of futility has got you down, look forward to that one. On a related note, if you like this video, please drop a like, put up a comment, and give my channel a subscribe. It means a heck of a lot to me as it helps immensely.